one of my favorite and perhaps the most powerful of all memory improvement techniques involves something I've mentioned many times on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, but often between the lines, I've urged you to include this wonderful technique in your daily habits. But I don't think I've ever addressed it as directly as right now in this episode. It's a technique that not only improves your memory, but structures your mind and quite possibly will help you fend off all manner of suffering, both while you're doing it and in the future. It has certainly provided me much solace during times when I have wished I could crawl under a rock. And then using this technique gives me many wonderful things to remember when I need that special help when I am under a rock. So what is this special memory technique that has been the source of so much solace and in fact the source of many livelihoods, including my own? It's writing. And unlike the memory palace technique we talk about so often on this podcast, I rarely if ever touch software for things like mnemonics. But I'm always on the hunt for new softwares that help improve how I write. Not just how fast I can write, but literally the nature of the content itself. And because that's so important for everybody to be able to express themselves through words, you know, the source of wealth is writing in so many ways. Wealth of relationships, wealth of health, wealth of the structure of your mind. I am so delighted to share with you a software called Essay that recently came across my radar, and you can find it at essay.app. And joining me to discuss what I have found so instantly useful in this software and the value of writing everything from essays to music is the founder of Essay, Julian Peterson. All the relevant links for finding out more about essay.app are in the description, in the words I just said right now, essay.app. And there are also links to Julian's incredible music, which we talk about music and the role of memory in music. And I think it's really, really interesting and powerful, especially since I myself do a lot with music and people ask me a lot about music and memory. So thanks as always for being subscribed to this channel, helping make sure with your thumbs up that the robots always remember that we humans still care about human memory and all that it can do to help us structure our minds and improve our memory. Julian, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I wanna talk about essay.app and how that all came to be. And I imagine there's some time that went into developing this. It wasn't just overnight, but I heard about it relatively recently. And there's a couple of things that got me excited about it. But just to dive into it, I mean, are we all doomed now that computers are writing for us? And, and how does that feel to be developing something like this in the midst of basically AI starting to just churn very fast? Let's call it space yeah. eight. I mean, it's is readable. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's readable. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Well, it's been a, it's kind of been a whirlwind uh, to be kind of remotely in that sphere in terms of software. I mean, we, when we started building, it was about four and a half, five years ago when we started kind of at least the ideation uh, part of, of the, of the product. And this sort of a generative AI writing was not really on uh, people's radar at that point. It certainly wasn't on my radar. I don't think it was on the public's radar. Uh, certainly it existed to a certain extent at that time, but it wasn't particularly interesting. Uh, certainly people weren't using it. Kind of the the kind of extent of people using those tools were things like Grammarly or things that kind of adjusted the structure or grammar of a single sentence. But those were very simple um, and and not nearly as interesting as, as something like chat GPT or some of these large language models. Um, so, you know, the fact that we launched about a year and a half ago, and then these language models came on the scene like six to eight months later has been kind of a, it, well, it was a surprise and it's been, I'd say a, a real positive in terms of kind of what we're trying to do at essay, because, you know, our, our entire, I guess, philosophy behind the product is that it's beneficial for people to do the writing themselves, right? right? And to develop those skills, to, to develop the ability to, you know, learn what compels you to investigate that, to do the research, to, you know, to do the editing because there's value in it, right? Because it clears, it, it clarifies the ideas in your own thinking. And so that's, that is kind of the underlying philosophical 
goal of the platform. And it's so interesting that at the same time as that, that these AI platforms have come onto the scene and pretty much allow people to bypass a lot of that um, if they want to. Right? right. And so people really do have the choice right now uh, to, to decide, okay, well, you know, what's, what am I actually trying to do when I sit down to write something? Do I just want the outcome? So I, do I just want, you know, six paragraphs on, you know, whatever question I've decided to ask? Or is it actually me trying to deepen my thinking and investigate these ideas? And is that the goal? And so I think that people, you know, when they when they write something, they have to ask themselves that question now is like, what are you actually doing? Um, and we've tried to position essay as the platform that is for the people who want to do it for themselves for their own benefit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's given us an interesting position in the market. Uh, you know, I don't think that we've really pushed that as far as we are likely going to in the future in terms of really kind of leaning into that as as what we're doing. But it's certainly uh, something that's a topic of discussion and something that's percolating in my mind pretty much all the time when I'm thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. marketing, branding, all that stuff is, yeah, <laughs> is its own world in a way. Um, well, one thing that really interested me about it instantly once I got in, I you got to kind of get in to, to see what it's all about. But why I, I got excited is is basically a personal history story and i had my first teaching experience at, was at york university when i was in the the phd program there for mark weber and mm. he told me something that came to mind as soon as i saw inside essay which was that students often have the sentences out of order they'll usually have the beginning of the paragraph at the end when it should be at the beginning. And when I was told that, I would realize that's the problem with my writing is that I've constantly <laughs> got like the sentences out of order. So that was my main excitement with what you've got going on in here. I mean, there's other cool things with versioning and so forth, being able to see multiple versions of sentences and, and then multiple mm -hmm. versions of the entire thing. But to me that, I don't know how we should call it, rotatability or Yeah, we call it the reorder tool, tool, but reorder tool. we have two, <laughs> yeah, we have two tools that, that's kind of our tools are designed for a particular purpose. So there's obviously they're designed so that the platform's easy to use and that those processes are are easy, but it's also to show the writer that that's actually an important part of the process. Right. right? And so making that specific part of the editing process a core tool was was very intentional. And so, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think, well, you know, at some point in my editing process, what I should do is I should look at each sentence and make sure it's in the right place, right? But that's definitely something that every everyone should do as they're writing. You know, it's especially because people tend to write in not exactly a straightforward way, right? Like you're meandering towards the goal when you're writing. And so right. it, it's not likely that when you've produced your draft that everything is going to be in the right place. And so it's definitely essential to to do that at the sentence level and at the paragraph level and depending on the length that you know the chapter or the or the sub chapter level as well. And so yeah, the platform is is uh is designed specifically to make sure that that process is one of the steps that you take. Um and I think that you know one of the directions we want to go with in terms of teaching people that because you know I, I think the software teaches them that just by putting it front and center, but we we also want to kind of build some tools that help people understand that that that's you know the specific reason and what to look for when you're when you're investigating your sentences. So that's you know that's a part of the platform that's always that's in development at the moment is the part that kind of does a little bit more instruction in that area so that people know why the reorder tool exists. Because uh, mm -hmm. obviously you know why because you were told by your professor and you're like oh yeah that's that's like makes that makes that a lot easier and but yeah, some yeah. people don't even understand that that's a that's a real value proposition. Um, yeah yeah yeah. No, I think that's huge. Another thing. This is maybe more for people who are getting older like myself, but I've written so many books, so many blog posts, blah, 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 blah. I've literally kind of destroyed myself. <laughs> so <laughs> anything that reduces a click is interesting to me because if I'm going to copy and or you know highlight and then right click to copy and, and then right click again to paste it, like just being able to click it once and move the sentence is already ergonomically, I guess is the word, going to yeah. reduce sort of pain. And, you know, I can prove if anybody actually cares about my keyboard history here, but like I need a keyboard like this in order to be able to save my shoulders because I've just written right. so much and clicked so much. And I used to need a mouse that uh, had a little red dot 
And then oh, I, yeah. forget, I forget exactly how it worked, but somehow it knew to click without me having to, huh. to, to touch it. Luckily, this keyboard has restored it that I can click still. But I Yeah, that's very cool. I've never seen a keyboard like that. That's extremely ergonomic, really, because I have one of the split keyboards, uh, mm. not not completely split. So it's, you know, got, it's like one, one step in that direction, but not, uh, not nearly as, as, as far as that, but that's, that's very interesting. And I'm sure a lot of people, uh, in, in our, in our lifetimes will, will suffer from that same sort of thing. You know, yeah. everyone's bent over a computer doing that. <laughs> so anyway, another yeah, but, little, little sub priority, but I really liked that about it, <laughs> reducing clicks. Hey, well, that's that's part of the idea, right? Is you want to make the, the parts of writing that aren't, part of the creative process, really simple to do, right? The the kind of, the, the parts that you need to do in order to make sure that uh, that all your ideas are presented in their best way, but that really are arduous, right? Like the, the, you know, looking at each sentence, figuring out where it's supposed to be in the paragraph, doing iterations of sentences, you know, you mentioned that you can do that in the app. That's, that's what we call the rewrite tool. And you can click on a sentence and produce, um, and then you, you yourself can produce iterations of that sentence, you know, make it shorter, change the ideas slightly, change the words around. Um, and you can do that in the app freely without losing the the history of that edit. So it's, it's, and that's also about removing that friction. So there's, you know, there's a couple types of friction that, that we're looking to remove. One certainly is, you know, the sort of friction that any software person is trying to remove, which is how to, you know, get from A to B easily without, you know, making the the user need to click multiple things or have to do something mm -hmm. complex. And so that's that's always something. But but also we're trying to reduce intellectual and creative friction by basically saving the history of even the detail work. Because, you know, sometimes, well, people really care about the work they do, of course. You know, you spent hours or years or days or whatever it is you know, producing this piece of writing and, you know, then sometimes making changes is hard because you get attached to it. And we mm -hmm. we're trying to make it easy for people to do that and to experiment and play with their ideas uh, and without, without being afraid of messing it up or losing something or, and that's kind of why we've kind of taken the version history idea, which exists in lots of other platforms and made it, you know, brought it to the sentence level and allowed people to really create very, very specific version history there. So, right, right. yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good thing. There's there's almost a way in which you can avoid a certain OCD because I remember when I was uh, in Toronto going to school, I had a friend and I was in my early days doing fiction and stuff like that. And he said, whatever you do, always copy it, copy any revision that you do into a new document. And so this has entered my head for it been in my head since it entered. And I just always have V1, V2, V3. Like I never actually edit anything. I always copy the whole new document right. into another thing, change the V number, and then edit that. I don't find that I ever really have said anything so brilliant that I have to go back and find earlier versions. <laughs> but occasionally it does happen when there's a copy paste error, or you erase something or what have you. And it's kind of cool to be able to know that that stuff is is there if you need to sift sift for it in yeah, the actual absolutely. singular screen so to speak rather than spread across in yeah i definitely did versions i did exactly that when i was writing uh, in university you know v1 v2 you know draft right, right. 18 <laughs> final you know the the, <laughs> the 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 document titles became uh quite quite something but yeah this this makes it quite a bit easier and obviously we have an automated version of history, which, which, which is helpful because it, you know, you, you get, you know, it gets a named dish version or a time stamped version every once in a while, which is good, but then you can, yeah, then you can also kind of create your own version history at the same time with your, with your fine edits, which, which I, I really like, I'm actually using it right now. I'm a, I'm a songwriter right. and one of the, and I'm using it right now for, for songwriting. And I find that it makes writing poetry or lyrics or whatever, way easier because you can you can completely change the rhyming structure or the cadence of an entire stanza or verse or whatever without losing the previous one and you can change and and that's just basically impossible to do in any other app without copying it into a completely new one and you know rewriting the whole thing and this way you can kind of toggle between the two and kind of see them in the context without the other one and it it really helps that creative process to be able to do that without without uh 
worrying about losing your previous uh, progress. And so that's been very helpful to me as I've, as I've been using it in that way. And I had no idea when we were building it that that would be a use case. Um, and But that's the sort of thing that's kind of fun to discover when you make kind of an open-ended piece of software. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it tends to find uses that that were unintentional. Well, I wanted to ask you about music, actually. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I heard your music. I hope this is a compliment, but I instantly was thinking, wow, this is like tragically hip in some sense. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Really, that's definitely a compliment. Some, some flavor in there anyway, especially in the second half of the first song where the, you know, it just had. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that song hip. in particular yeah. had that feel. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. okay, good. I'm glad that's a compliment because I love tragically hip and uh, yeah, I really uh, liked your, your music a great deal. So I want to ask oh, about that a bit much. more. Sure. But before before maybe we we go into music because that's mm -hmm. kind of its own rabbit hole. Um, yeah, you you mentioned essay being for people who want to do it themselves, and so mm -hmm. I'm just curious a little bit. You mentioned your own university writing and so forth. Where are you at with your writing, or what your what was your history as a as a student? Was it something that came a little more naturally for you, or did you struggle with it, or I would say. In it was some, somewhat in between. I wouldn't say I really struggled as a writer. I, I struggled with with um, I struggled with perfectionism to a certain extent, which is something I still struggle with 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 uh, both songwriting and just general writing. Um, and so that's I mean that's part of the reason why we've leaned into this. Why I've been so interested in those particular features, the ones that kind of prevent the the need for being a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. But that was something that I would say I struggled with most. In terms of, I was also lazy. It was that it was, it was a combination of, <laughs> of perfectionism and laziness. And so, I would uh, I wouldn't want to edit my work, right? And I think a lot of, especially young writers, do that, right? Like they'll write something and be like, "It's it's done," you know. Yeah. You write a draft <laughs> and it's done, and that's you know obviously not true at all. Um, you know, once you do anything, you know, it's it, it's funny because people never think that about other other forms of of. Uh, of work, right? You'd never like do one code on your wall and then decide no, that's no. done. Well, unless it really <laughs> was, I guess. But but that's pretty uncommon, you know. And 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 so I would, I definitely suffered from from doing that. I would I would put my ideas down, and then I would either because I wasn't a very good editor, and so really couldn't didn't have the processes uh, that I needed to to like systematically improve my writing. But also, um, I was somewhat lazy with not wanting to kind of rethink the things that I'd already thought. Uh, and so that was something that my dad really helped me with uh, when I was, uh, especially in my later years of my undergrad, I did a degree of philosophy and contemporary philosophy, basically, and music. Um, wow. And so I did a lot of writing. I went to University of King's College, um, which is in East Coast, Canada, Nova Scotia. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, and they put a really big focus, especially in the first year program on essay writing. Uh, you write an essay every two weeks, uh, about a 2000 word essay. Uh, every student in this program does an essay every two weeks. And so it's a very kind of a cool way of learning to write because you get a lot of feedback from professors. Um, and yeah, every two weeks you have an essay and sometimes, uh, at, you know, there's term projects that are longer. And so I got a lot of practice writing, writing essays, which, and in a very well-structured environment, which, which helped me kind of understand a good way to instruct writing. Um, however, it's not, it wasn't particularly it doesn't translate particularly well to to software. It's hard to hard to transition that style of writing education where it's kind of a cohort and you get a lot of feedback from someone who's much better than you at writing. And that's mm -hmm. like perhaps an ideal way of writing. I know that, um, for instance, uh, a guy named David Peril uh, is doing mm -hmm. that on Twitter, rite of passage. He does has this like writing school, which is essentially exactly that, right? Like you, you go in, you're a cohort, you learn to write, you, you know, have an edit, editing circle, and you also learn from from someone who's you know well versed in all sorts of uh, writing philosophy. So that's yeah. kind of an ideal way of, of of learning to write, but in, you know, it only scales so well. Uh, and and one of the goals of, of essay is is to try to scale that as best as we can. Uh, in a way that's kind of yeah mass scalable, so you know inexpensive and and in a way that's kind of built into the software, so that so, so it does that. So, yeah, I would say that was my those were my biggest struggles writing. I I definitely became much more interested in writing in my fourth year when I did my uh, my honors thesis, which I wrote on Heidegger, and I uh, compared it to 
uh, kind of the 1960s psychedelic movement. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so that was really fun. I, uh, I really enjoyed that. And it was kind of an out there topic to investigate. Um, I think so it was definitely kind of, out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so were the psychedelics. So it was a nice, it was a cool overlap. Um, and so, mm-hmm. yeah, like Huxley and, and, uh, and, uh, what's his name? Terrence McKenna and a lot of, a lot of guys like that. And I just found there were a lot of parallels between the way that Heidegger, like his phenomenology is, and the way he, he described it was extremely similar to how these, how a lot of these uh, writings on the psychedelic experience uh, were presenting the world. And I just thought that was fascinating. And uh, yeah. uh, so I investigated that. And that was probably the first time that I wrote something that was actually an investigation that I really deeply cared about. Um, and so that was uh, a good, a good thing to learn uh, to learn about and to learn that exists, that writing can be that, that it can be an internal investigation that's kind of uh, motivating in that way. Yeah. yeah. And right now um, I do some writing, although I'm not writing. Um, I'm, I'm mostly writing music at the moment. That's about what I, that's, that's my main thing I do uh, and software, of course. And so that, that but the <laughs> software I don't find uh, has that many parallels, but it has some. Well, how do you, how do you, how do you manage those different parts of the brain i think i have a little sense myself i mean i, I toured as a musician myself and oh, so cool. forth but i'm curious how you managed to switch because I, I don't know what it what is involved in software development or management of teams or anything like that but i imagine it's quite involved and has a different part of the brain than you know stanza a stanza b you know what what mode you're in you're going to use lydian or <laughs> whatever yeah you know in, i think music. there's there's some overlap and there's some difference that's very nice right like when you're when you're managing or when you're writing software it's very it it's very especially writing software it's extremely engrossing right so you need to get deep into the problem uh, especially if it's something complex obviously um and music is a, a great way to break out of that mindset and so you know I, I i'd say i'm for someone who builds software i'm probably more on the creative side um which is i guess partly why i've started a company and and doing management and software and music and a whole bunch of different things to kind of Maybe. satisfy that that impulse. But I find that there's some similarity too. You know, there's a lot of patterns in music and and obviously those patterns translate well to math or or um or software or anything that's kind of on the logical side. So so it, it I would say that they they probably help each other to a certain extent, as well as uh, you know, the fact that just performing music itself is cathartic and and is mm-hmm. a great way to recover emotionally from well pretty much anything from my experience that's how i do it right. so yeah well i think you, you mentioned at the beginning that there's probably more positives for the essay project than negatives from the ai and it kind of comes down to the idea that and and you know i don't know if you'll agree with this but my thought is is that the scarcity on language as it goes down in terms of the production uh, uh, of text, like there's almost zero scarcity in having some words on a screen, basically. Right. The value of the actual idea goes up. And mm-hmm. so that I think is a very exciting thing because a huge part of the emphasis here is on thinking about what you're doing and then actually putting some thought in there. But in the... Yeah. In the the accompanying writing guide, something that jumps out at, at me that Dr. Peterson puts in there, this is from memory, so I don't know if I am nailing it, but to me, I think it's mm. the salient point, is that investing in learning to structure your thoughts is essentially protecting your brain against the pain of old age or you know, giving yourself some resilience for, for dealing with you know what's going to happen as 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 your body you know starts to give you issues and so forth. So I think yeah, absolutely, yeah, it does. That's that, right? super valuable, it, it, and it's going to require it strengthens ideas. the mind, yeah. right? It strengthens your mind to to be coherent, right? And I think that that's essentially the argument that that's made in that guide is that you know while you're writing, while you're investigating ideas, the ideas have to be important to you because. That otherwise it doesn't improve your 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 coherence and strengthen your mind. But if you're investigating ideas that either bother you or are important to you, or you feel like you know they're shining at you, I suppose as Heidegger would say. Um, yes. But um, 
but that that's what helps kind of strengthen your mind against you know the the pain of the future let's say or um whatever's going to happen right and if you're the more coherent that you are in terms of what you think and and whether you know and the less prone you are to you know uh let's say being overtaken by someone else's ideas uh that that you that you probably shouldn't believe in or or just being overcome by you know that the events that are likely to unfold in your life and the things that are hard so yeah i think that it, it has it has real value learning to write and 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 in just learning to that your ideas are worth investigating and worth uh you know becoming coherent about i think that most people don't really feel that way about their own ideas but um but probably because they just don't really know that that's something that they should be doing and and that it would benefit pretty much everybody to be able to do i find it very tragic cuz i talk to a lot of people and they they seem to have a lot of a, what do you call it self deprecation where mm. they they're actually saying things that amongst i don't know educated people i guess are are, are common ideas and they're just as valuable, but because they don't have academic training, they somehow don't seem to recognize that those ideas are of just as much value in any circle. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, as I was thinking about this interview, I remembered a book that I'd read that I found fascinating and it's not necessarily a good book, but it's called Just Being Difficult. And I think it is good, but I mean, all I think books are valuable, period, because they have ideas in them. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a strange book because it's kind of like a for or against academics writing with all these, like Heidegger simple compared to some of these people. In yeah, yeah, circles, for sure. Right? Um, but, you know, sometimes they say, sometimes your ideas do need these hyper complicated words. And then other people are saying, well, no, actually, if, if, if you understand it, you should be able to, to explain it simply. And I don't know, I'm actually kind of I'm not entirely sure where I fall on that because I went through some of that training and, you know, I can talk about Heidegger and Gewurfenheit and, you know, start to change my language a little bit and, and get more twisted and naughty and gnarly. And I would say <laughs> that actually there are some things that if you, if you don't go through that trial by fire, you know, you, you may never find the simplicity because yeah. you might just wind up saying, well, why is that such an important idea? That's so simple. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's not that easy. Yeah. Well, the language that philosophers use, that's really complicated. I mean, it depends on the philosopher. There's certainly some philosophers who were not very good at distilling their ideas. Uh, that That's okay. definitely true, you know, but there's also some philosophers that were really good at it and the translation is just bad. Uh, that's, and that's, that's a big problem. You know, that's, that's, I would maybe even the main problem. It's very hard to tell when, when it's the problem and when it's not, unless you speak all the relevant languages. Um, but with Heidegger, I always find his translations were quite good, and and the the complexity. I mean, there's a lot of complexity, I suppose, in, in his thinking. But but he also just makes up a lot of words, which makes it harder to to read because you have to be learning a whole new vocabulary of of I I don't know of I guess a whole new philosophical uh, vocabulary, and that that just makes it harder to to, to read. To, regardless of the complexity of the sentences or, or whatever. And I guess it's, it's kind of like reading a Russian novelist, right? Like it's, it, it, the books aren't necessarily hard, but it is hard to remember the names of all right. the people because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they have eight of them and they're very long and, and they're not names that you use every day. So that's, uh, that's always, I think. And they usually have nicknames no too. Yeah. Yeah. I found that <laughs> I, I had to read crime and punishment, like five or six times because I would get through half of it and then I'd get distracted and do something else for a bit. And then I'd come back to the book and I'd be like, I have no idea who any of these people are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Luckily, luckily I've gotten a little better at that, at reading more, more of the Russian literature. And now it's a little easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. Reading is its own sort of world. And I think reading, I mean, I've re read research that reading is much improved if you do writing, uh, Mm -hmm. It's called target scanning, but that relates to writing by hand as opposed mm. to typing. What what do you think about the the whole debate? I mean, it's not really a debate. I mean, it's just a scientist producing evidence that either confirms or denies hypo hypothetical statements about the world. But some people mm -hmm. are just very pro digital everything, and others are saying no. There's a thing called digital dementia. I prefer to actually call it digital amnesia because at least there's like light at the end of the tunnel. Right. But you know, this <laughs> yeah. idea that our online exposure 
is actually harming not only our memory, but our attention span and so forth. Yeah. And, and and that's another thing where it's like hard to fall on a particular issue. But I wonder, especially as someone one. who's developing these tools, you know, what you think about that. Uh, yeah, I, I, it, that's that's a it's a very interesting problem because I think that digital tools both help us and hurt us in different ways, right? Like it certainly they harm our attention, especially smartphones and things like that that are you know completely designed to do that to capture your attention. Uh, in, in terms of writing, I mean, there's certainly a lot of evidence that writing by hand is beneficial for retention and uh, for all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. I like it for for retention. I, I like writing ideas on a meeting by hand. I think that I retain them better. Um, however, there's also a lot of benefit in this in simplicity of of capturing ideas, right? Like that's there's there's a lot of value in that, and and it's hard to do that by hand in the modern world. You're not sitting at your desk all the time, and, and most people don't carry a notebook or a pencil or anything. And when an idea comes to your mind, it's it's very valuable to capture it. And then it's very valuable to have that information in a structured environment so that you can use it in the future. And so there's, you know, you are kind of externalizing your brain by using these, you know, these devices. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that there's, you know, a variety of things that are harmful about that. And, you know, I think people are probably worse storytellers than they used to be. Uh, um, I know, I know by from personal experience. I don't know if the research backs this up, but but people who are illiterate are often extremely good storytellers. Now, I don't know how true that is, but but from my experience, I know a few people who are illiterate, and they communicate in story a lot more effectively than than people who read. And mm. why is that? I'm not sure. Maybe it's just that your memory works differently if you can't read. Um, but I think that any sort of technology probably has that sort of outcome is, is you kind of are externalizing some process that could be done in a different way inside your own brain. So, I mean, I mean certainly building this software, I think there's enough value that, that, uh, to add that it, that it merits, um, development over, you know, simply writing on a, on, on a piece of paper, but, um, you also gotta, you know, it's, it's kind of an individual thing as well, right? You have to find out what works for you. And certainly if one of the parts of your process might be writing things by hand and that that can certainly be integrated and there's there's software for taking that and putting it on your computer afterwards right, if, right, you, right. if you really want to so yeah yeah i mean it's uh, it's a tough one it's just something that people have to navigate and and figure out what is harming them and and or or helping them you know i like i have to delete social media every you know once in a while just to so that I don't become addicted to it because <laughs> right, it's so right. addictive and you just kind of have to, you have, you have to be paying attention to that because there are extremely intelligent people who are trying to keep your attention and, right. and, you know, it'd be the more you can keep your attention your own and directed in the way that that is your intention, I would say the better. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a, a strange problem. I don't know how to word on the internet, but I watched a guy review essay and he mm. was you know, going through different things and pros and cons and et cetera. Then on another video, I just checked out one more video on his channel. He was saying, I don't use Obsidian. And he wanted to make this video to highlight, I think, what is a very, very important problem is that the algorithms seem to want to make us be the guy who does this or the person who does that. And so it almost makes it seem like I use this. So that's the only thing that I use as opposed to having that wide range that you just discussed. And uh, if you don't want to retype what you just wrote by hand, you know, scan it and it'll it'll appear in the machine. So it doesn't yeah. have to be like one thing for all things. Yeah, well, and that's part of the another kind of aspect of the philosophy behind essay is that we want it to help people write regardless of where they're writing. Mm. Now, we certainly are trying to get people to write on the platform because otherwise, you know, what's the point? But yeah. <laughs> but. We also are kind of trying to in, kind of instill a, an editing style and philosophy, and you know, and teach them what aspects, how to approach editing, and how to approach creative production, or different ways that they can do that within the you know the set of tools that we offer. And the idea behind that is is certainly that we're training them to write uh, to a certain extent, and, and you know, we can only you can only do so much, but we're trying to we're trying our best to to train people to 
to be, you know, rethinking their ideas and trying to represent them in different ways and, you know, separating the process of creative production and editing so that they aren't, um, you know, self-editing while they're trying to get creative inspiration, which is, which is certainly a problem a lot of people face. Mm -hmm. um, and just having those tools in the software hopefully will impact the way people would write, even if they're writing in a, you know, on a piece of paper or on a Word document or wherever they're writing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's an, an exciting thing about it. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to how it develops because I can see all, also the other side of the coin. Like we, we don't necessarily want just the one tool that we do all things, but then certainly back in the day, there was an app that I, I thought quite highly of because I came out of the academic background. I had all these loopy long sentences and the first app I used was called Hemingway app. And it Oh yeah, I, punished, I like Hemingway apps. Punished app. you yeah. basically with all these colors. <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed by so many <laughs> colors, but I gradually learned to write shorter and shorter sentences. But the thing was, is that I stuck with it for mm -hmm. this period of time. And so I think it, it's a little bit of retraining the brain to edit a little bit differently, but that sort of be a thing of being able to reorder it. I mean, we basically know it takes about 90 days for, for uh, certain aspects of uh you know rewiring in the brain right, your plasticity habits, yeah. to change so if a person is mm. going to use a software i think you've got to put in a good 90 days at least before you even start to like judge it too much yeah uh, because absolutely. of that need for change um yeah so, well yeah hemingway app is great that was something that i looked looked at and used quite a bit a, a number of years ago and um yeah, it's funny. All those colors, eh? there's such a deterrence. It's like, oh, no, I got to get rid of these colors. <laughs> yeah, but it, 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 it's like uh, a use case where if you were to yeah. edit in a particular way, set it up so that as you, as you have formulated there with the guide and focus on this idea, make sure it's an idea worth having sort of thing. What are the parts of the idea? And then actually being able to rearrange things. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and so I could talk a little bit about the about what we want to do in the future with it because it is you know a platform that's actively in development, it's still a beta. It's something that we are adding things to constantly at the moment. Um, and so, you know, when we when we built it, we focused kind of on the editing stage uh, primarily, and so that was that was kind of what we wanted to do. We we gave people a regular document so that they can you know write and and write freely, and that's all fine. Uh, but that's kind of the simple part of the app, and then the part where we added complexity and, you know, interesting features was the editing part. So being able to rewrite sentences, being able to drag things around easily, being able to drag sentences specifically, which is kind of a, one of the unique features that, that you've, that you've talked about. Um, but kind of the direction that we want to do is we kind of want to fill out that process that the one that's outlined in the guide. And so, right. And then the first part of that is finding compelling ideas. Um, and so what's the question you want to investigate? And so we're, we're starting to build, a tool that helps people do that, that helps people yeah. find out what is bothering them, what is motivating them. Um, you know, if you get an assignment from class, it'll help you identify the angle that interests you. Uh, and then, so that'll be, that'll be interesting. And we're actually using large language model uh, technology to try to, to try to do that. And, and so that's kind of the first integration of that technology that we're attempting in the platform is uh, to try to help our users uh, come up with the topics that motivate them because obviously that's there's a whole bunch of reasons to do that of, of course it's you know useful for the person to know that that's what they should do um and so having a tool is is, is valuable there but also it should uh dramatically in, increase people using the platform because uh it, you know writing is hard and you don't always not everybody is always writing something and so um getting people to use the platform by you know helping it you know, help people develop their own questions, I suppose, uh, will be will be very valuable in that area. So we're excited about that to kind of fill out the topic selection part of it. Um, and then we're also introducing a feature called notes, which is kind of our first entry into the research phase of the, of the writing process, because, uh, you know, what you do is you find a topic and then you maybe write an outline or maybe you ask a bunch of sub questions about that topic. And then you do research and you collect notes and references. Um, and so we're kind of building that part of it out where you'll be able to have a reading list. You'll be able to associate the reading list with an essay. And then you'll be able to take notes and link those notes to essays and to outline 
sections or paragraphs or even to sentences. So that'll be, uh, we're actually releasing that this month. That's that, that, that development work is done for the notes feature. Um, and so that's really exciting because it, it's a, it's by far the biggest feature that we've built since, um, since we released the the software, it kind of touches every aspect of it and you can, um, and then at the same time, we're developing a phone, a phone use, uh, it's not exactly a mobile app. We're going to build a mobile app hopefully later this year, but this is our first foray into making as a usable on a phone. Um, and so it'll be a, um, it's called a progressive web app. And so it's, it's basically a mobile app, but it isn't in the app stores, um, at the mm. moment. So that's, that's really cool. cool. And we, and we have a whole bunch of, uh, um, it's almost done, but there's a whole bunch of design changes uh, to the software to make it really easy to use on your phone. And I actually find it a very satisfying mobile writing experience because what what how do people write on their phones? Usually people take notes on their phones or they focus on one idea and investigating it, right? Like normally you don't write a whole chapter on your phone or something. There are people that do that, but most people don't do that. And so this app is actually really, really helpful for that exact use case. First of all, for the note taking aspect and then keeping those notes organized. Uh, if you're, you know, just thinking about a, a writing project, you know, on the go, then you can add the note and link it to the project. And then it's available while you're writing on the sidebar. So that's really helpful. Um, and then just the rewrite tool on your phone is very helpful as well, because it allows you to do fine edits on your phone, which is actually very difficult in a regular word processor because it's such a small screen. Uh, and there's a lot of text. It's usually kind of a wall of text. There's not enough mm. space. I feel like a lot of people, myself included, uh, or maybe just me, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but I get a little bit overwhelmed when there's a lot of text on my phone and I need to edit it because half the screen is taken up by the keyboard and it, it's just a little bit of a tough experience. Yeah. Um, so this this kind of helps. It, it, it reduces the amount of information on the screen and helps you iterate in a very uh, specific way while while you're on your phone. So that'll be that'll be good, and it should also get a lot more people using the platform because uh, most people are just on their phones all the time now instead of on the computer. Yeah. So so it's a big a big share of the market that uh, that we're kind of missing out on by not having it available. Well, that's exciting. I I used to write entire books on my phone when I back when I had a S4, but oh, yeah. the app that i used they never updated themselves so i can't use it anymore it was it was, it was huh. fantastic and i just don't write anymore because there's no app that uh, allows for what, uh, what what was great at that time but what was the app you remember? i think it was just called text edit and oh yeah well, te text edit you can't go wrong <laughs> but it, i mean i don't know that it has any relationship to the the doc on apple right. or whatever or the program yeah. on apple but it whatever it was it 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 was as clean as possible and, you know, I would make sure that I kept within 2000 words or what have you on any given document, but then it would just mm -hmm. instantly beam it up to Dropbox. Now, this is back in S4 days, but, uh, right. or you know, 2011, 2012, 13, maybe up to 2015, but I edited or I wrote one book on Google Docs on my phone and I'll never do it again because it was just a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know yeah, how I got that Yeah, it's kind of far. clunky on your phone, weirdly yeah. enough. I mean, obviously it's a great platform. They do a heck of a lot for a, for a web yeah. app, but it doesn't have a good mobile experience at all. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I don't know. I, I guess they're just, trying to do too much, probably. That's what it is. You know, it does need it to be relatively be. simple. But searching yeah. different parts of it and what did I say in chapter five or whatever, I'm trying to do a whole 100,000 page book in, or 100,000 word page, uh, book, better said, 100,000 words. Right. It's just crazy. But I, I wanted to give it a try. Um, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it is it is pretty beneficial just to be able to write whenever, wherever you are, right? I mean, that's, what Stephen King says about reading, right? It's like, just do it everywhere you are, no matter what, just read, yeah, yeah. read everywhere. And I mean, the same could be said about writing. It, it certainly trains that part of your mind that is able to generate ideas and then work on them on the go. So if you can do that on the go, then you definitely should. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but yeah. being able to write while you're at the beach or what have you, I mean, there's, there's nothing better than that uh, without exactly, having to have a big yeah. a laptop, you know, and especially in Australia, it's so hot that you, your laptop is actually going to melt if you. Right. Right. It'll <laughs> stick to you for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me, if it's okay, yeah. I, I'd just love to ask a little bit about music. Uh, yeah, let's do it. I know there's lots involved because there's the composition of the music and then there's the message you want to convey or the story you want to tell and often both at the same time mm -hmm. just just as a high order question what what it, what makes music good for you yeah well i mean i've always loved music and pretty much 
all genres and any 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 of that. So I love listening to music, but I use it as you know, it's a form of emotional expression, I suppose. I, that's probably the best way to think about it. I use it for a number of things. I, I play music as somewhat of I guess the the same sort of thing that a prayer would be for a religious person probably is right. or is is probably what I use it for. It it's something that allows me to you know, communicate with myself or or whatever you want to say in a way that's deep and a way that's kind of distinct from my relationship with the outside world. And so that's one of the things I use music for. I certainly write songs that are about my experience. That's that's most of it. I write I write personal songs. Mm-hmm. I don't really I mean, sometimes they dive into other topics that, you know, briefly there, there's some like social commentary and stuff now and then in it, but usually it's subtle and usually somewhat abstract. Uh, like you wouldn't necessarily know that it's a, uh, that that's what it's about, but that's just how I'm expressing it. And so I use it for that. I use it to, you know, keep a a memory of who I was at a time. Um, and, and so it's, I guess, somewhat of a diary in that way, although it's a diary that's meant to be shared. Um, and so uh, that's that's part of it. And those, those are probably the main things I use it for. And I, I also just love performing music. It's, it's a great way of connecting people or connecting with people. Um, it's, it feels really good. Um, and I'm, yeah, I would probably do it all the time if, uh, <laughs> if uh, well, I do pretty much do it all the time to be fair. I, uh, <laughs> whenever I'll be like making breakfast for my kids in the morning and, and I'll have my guitar. Uh, <laughs> when the eggs when the eggs are cooking i'll just be playing guitar in the kitchen my wife makes fun of me but uh but i, I pretty much every spare moment um uh, i'll i'll be picking it up or working on a song or or just playing so it's yeah. It's, yeah it's a great it's a great social tool uh and it's a great internal tool for grounding yourself and and investigating what you think and who you are really yeah when you learn music do you have a specific process for getting it deep into your memory. I I get asked a lot about memorizing music and I, unfortunately I I have pretty standard answers. I can use some mnemonics selectively, but I'm just curious how you go about uh, remembering music. Yeah. You know, it's, it's probably the thing I'm worst at with music. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that this is one of those examples of technology being a uh, kind of ruining that. Uh, because I always have, I pretty much always am in front of a computer or my phone or something that has the music on it, uh, right. written down in some way, a tab or just a chords and, and lyrics. It does make it much harder to memorize, um, just cause it's always available. I definitely find that I memorize it a lot easier if I'm not looking at it at all. I'm right. And, and just taking memorizing one part at a time, you know, doing repetition in that area. Um, right. Also internalizing the story is very helpful for me. Um, certainly, uh, you know, cause a lot of, a lot of songs have relatively obscure lyrics or, or abstract lyrics or lyrics that are specific to the artist, but making that kind of internalizing that story so that you're telling it uh, and it means something to you specifically is helpful. Right. I find in the memorization process, you know, trying to embody the song, I suppose would be a, a right, a good way of thinking about it. So I found that when I, um, I did some shows before some of my dad's lectures, I was opening for his shows. And so I needed to uh, remember some songs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that was like, I was like, Oh no, I have to remember some songs. So, so I, um, so that was one of the things that really helped was, was making the song my own, uh, at least, some understanding of that song my own so that I wasn't, you know, just playing a cover. And I mean, some of the songs I played were, were songs I'd written, but I also struggled to remember those songs. It's not just, uh, it's not just those. So that, that's a tough one. It's tough to, it's tough to remember. I mean, one of the things that helps a ton is just knowing music theory. Uh, that helps a lot because right. obviously <laughs> there's a ton of patterns. Uh, there's some things that don't happen in music very often. And so then when you're listening to music, you hear the pattern, you're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, whatever the, the number pattern is. And and you also, when you hear something unexpected, you'll know, well, that doesn't fit my, you know, memory of common patterns. And then you'll be able to, you know, experiment with the, with, with where, where it could be. And that trains your ear as well. Right, um, right. And so that, that's, that's very helpful. Just kind of 
learning a lot of songs and trying to recognize patterns that that exist in the music that's been helpful for me like the better a guitar player i've gotten the easier it has been to not exactly remember songs but be able to play them easily uh and that's that's somewhat similar and to be able to guess what the next chord is even if i don't remember it i like i can i know what it is based on my understanding of of the way chords are <laughs> right 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 yeah and the way the melody is and so that 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 helps so just i guess deepening your your musical understanding certainly helps with 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 memorizing well, that's a that's a hard one now obviously that's <laughs> that's not yeah. i wouldn't say that's like a good a good tip for a for most well, people it, who are looking to memorize something fast <laughs> it, it, it's kind of the the hard lesson of music music is inherently mnemonic at some level but its inherent mnemonicness does have to do with your understanding of theory i mean there's a i played a, a, in a band with a guy and he's just it, it's, it's just limited hexaphonic transpositions man like <laughs> oh okay Duh. but you know yeah. once i went and studied what that is it's like oh okay now i see you know like the the, the theory reveals how that you could just understand that and then once you understand it you don't really have to remember anything because that's what that is <laughs> you know that sort of thing. yeah so, yeah yeah well um, that's definitely true like you go into a, a for the first record i put it out was uh it's called site for anyone listening it's site to julian peterson on spotify it's there um but i was i recorded it with with a couple of studio musicians or some of it was it was studio musicians and i remember going in there and the songs some of them have quite a simple structure but there's a couple that kind of have unexpected structure and um and it was very interesting to watch these studio musicians learn the song because they each had their own way of writing them down like they weren't yeah, because I just brought in not sheet music, but you know, just words and chords basically, because that was essentially what it was. Um, and they would, they had just a very interesting way of jotting. They would write write by hand a lot of them uh, on a separate piece of paper, something. I mean, it's I guess it's how you see often um, people in orchestras writing. They they often have their own notation that they do as well. To uh, and I'm sure there's some uh, something about it that is similar that I don't understand. But um, mm -hmm. that was that was really cool. So certainly people have. Um, like the bass player would, you know, I think that he would write the rhythm down and write when he would come in. And I don't think he wrote notes. It was very interesting. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I, I, they, they all had their own way of doing it. But um, I I tend to write the chord structure and then I just remember the way the song is played, um, you know, but mostly it's muscle memory. I certainly uh, don't ever write that down um, in terms of just because I'm mostly I finger pick on the guitar. And so there's that that's mostly muscle memory and also, you know, repetitive pattern uh, recognition and that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. right. With finger picking more than anything, uh, any other type of guitar, probably it's, it's learning those patterns and, you know, embedding them in your muscle memory. Yeah. Oh, that's great. When you're writing, do you tend to do words first and then figure out the tune or do you start with a chord progression idea or, or it definitely it... depends. I, I often start with words, I would say. Um, although not always. It it, it kind of goes back and forth in the process. Usually I start with words and then I write a part to those words. And then I often write a second part that's music. And so I would, because it's harder to, uh, I, I guess maybe it's harder for me to write words that are different um, than, than, than the verse. Like if I'm writing a chorus, I, I almost always write the, the verses first. And then I write a chorus afterwards, which I, I don't know if that's, I actually think that's kind of different than how a lot of other people do it. I think people often write the chorus first, but I, I almost always write verses first. And that maybe that's because I'm usually telling a story um, and the the verses are usually the story and the chorus is usually some, you know, it complements the story in some way, but it usually doesn't move the story along in the same way. Um, but usually yeah, words, then and and the chords and the melody of that at the same time. I often write the melody before I uh, work on on any instrument. I I have I often come up with a melody in my head and then I'll try to try to find the chords, <laughs> uh, which sometimes I can do and sometimes I, I can't. And that's actually been um, something that I was very bad at for a while. I would you know wake up after a nap with a song in my head and I'd be like, oh that's really cool. But but then I would go to an instrument and I would play chords. And the chords that I would play would remove the song from my mind <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> because they were wrong. And I would, it was just like, I would lose it. And, and that was, that was frustrating. And so that that's been one thing that's been very helpful as I become a better musician where that's less likely to happen because I can better identify uh, the chords behind a melody. And so usually 
melody and lyrics kind of at the same time, then chords. And then I'll usually write chords to a, a, a couple other parts that are chords and fill in the lyrics after that, things that fit. Um, that's, that's, it's obviously not always that way, but that, that seems to be the general way I do it. And I often also leave songs for quite a while before I write the second part. Uh, I tend to have lyrics that I've written for you know, months or sometimes years that I'm like, don't really know exactly what to do with, but that, you know, it's part of an idea. And then I, uh, and then I usually write other parts uh, much, much later on. And that, that, tend, that seems to help me quite a bit. And, you know, I think that that can be said with any form of, of, of writing is that it's useful to put it aside for um, quite a while, come back with fresh eyes. So definitely. And they say where preparation meets opportunity, there is no ceiling. And the more right. writing you have, I mean, that's one of the secrets of the the great academics who seem to have so much stuff is that they're, they're just, oh, you got a deadline? No problem. And they've got this, this or not even academics, just any, uh, like Christopher Hitchens, you know, I'm sure that the, the legend of Hitchens was that he could have print ready copy in 12 hours or less. But I'm sure the secret was, is that he was probably just writing all the time. And he's like, oh, you need no this, an article on that. I've got like a draft and all I have to do is change the five sentences and it's ready to go. I don't know. I'm just speculating, but. Um, oh yeah. I imagine. I imagine. I mean, that <laughs> some people are so prolific. It's unbelievable. And yeah. certainly the more you practice being prolific, the more, <laughs> the more, the more you will become prolific. That's definitely one of those things, right? Like I've found uh, that recently as I've been writing these songs, they become, it becomes much easier to write songs, the more you write them. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly now and then you, you know, you get blocked in some way, just like anybody does. But, um, but definitely it, it comes a lot easier with, with practice and repetition and also not overthinking it. I think that a lot of artists tend to do the same thing that I do and did in my undergraduate, um, where you're trying to write the perfect song, uh, or you're trying to, or you spend so long writing it and you're that that you lose touch with it or you're trying to make it represent who you currently are instead of who you were when you wrote it the first time and then being and then trying to you know make sure it represents you in the moment and that's that's very hard i think that i read uh, rick rubin's book the creative act recently and right. his his chapter on um on why to release music or what that means to release music i can't remember that what the name of the chapter was but he was describing you know that part of the process, like releasing and sh sharing your music with the world and what that is. And, you know, he's, his, his idea is really that art is, you know, art, art is done for the sake of itself, right? It's an internal process. It's a revelation that you're, you know, that you're taking internally and working on. And, and that's your responsibility as an artist to, to do that work. Um, and then the sharing is, is, is kind of another part of that. It's not really part of that. So all you have to do with sharing is, say, okay, well, this is something I did. This is something I produced. Here it is. And you don't, I don't like, that's kind of how I've been trying to think about it. And it's worked, it worked well with my first project. That was essentially how I did my first project is my dad actually booked me studio time. Um, oh, wow. And so I had a deadline, <laughs> which is like, uh, which is, which is helpful um, sometimes, uh, but it certainly was helpful this time because I had like eight songs and they were all three quarters done. And so this was very helpful. I was able to you know, I had to choose some, I had to, you know, be prepared for the studio. And then, uh, and then after, after you did that, then it's just a matter of, you know, doing the mix and production. And and that was super cool, a very fun, fun process for me to, to, to learn how that, how that all works. And I'm doing a little differently this time, but, uh, but um, now I'm at least somewhat familiar with that process. Perfect. Well, I'm going to go check further. Cause I, I think I looked in the wrong place. I only saw a three album or sorry, a three song no no that is Bandcamp. right Camp. oh so there's not oh, yes. an eight song version on on spotify or no there isn't there's just three oh, okay. songs so far but i do have uh this next album that i'm recording in march will be eight or nine songs uh and so that'll be out hopefully this summer um at some point so that's those are the things i'm working on right now Ooh. yeah well, i look forward to that and also the future of sa i think you know just on that theme of keeping a stash of writing. If you, if you do that and you train and you write and you really understand the process, you don't necessarily need to go into the stash. I mean, it's helpful if you can, but you also have the procedural memory development of just being able to, to order things in a decent way and let go of the perfectionism of it and, and get it out there. So I really appreciate yeah. 
what you're doing and, and taking the time to chat about it a little bit today. And well, thank you very people much. can find you at sa.app, but also I think you're on, I don't, I don't know, X doesn't quite sound right yet, but that's what it's called. <laughs> I, I sometimes call it Twixter. But that's yeah, not, yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not right either. Uh, that has the right connotation, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. also I think you have Instagram and um, and YouTube as well. Yeah, that's so right. Some, some of your songs. Yeah, yeah. I'd say I'm most active on Instagram uh, with, I tend to put little musical clips up there and, and essays active on Instagram as well, if you want to follow us there, but certainly just going to the platform, checking it out. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress and we're also very open to feedback from anyone who wants to go in and tell us what they think. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. I want to thank Julian again for sharing the story of SA.app, and I encourage you to check it out and get writing yourself. If you're not already doing plenty of writing, well, there's oodles more to say about how much it helps with memory, with mental clarity, with structure that helps you invest in the future quality of your ability to think and remember. And I'm sure in the future we will explore it further. If you'd like more on the topic of how writing may have improved one person's memory in particular, I would suggest watching my video on the art of memory and Frances Yates, because she said she never used memory techniques, but amongst her circle of friends and other people who knew her professionally, apparently her memory was stellar. And there may be clues in the fact that she wrote a lot and wrote a lot about memory itself as a topic. So check that out next and stay tuned because there'll be more about how I myself write on this channel coming soon. In the meantime, keep yourself magnetic.